a mind that seeks happiness in objects or enlightenment in states of mind is destined for a life of misery punctuated by brief moments of respite have the the courage and the clarity to face that fact a mind that longs for happiness or seeks enlightenment must sink deeply into the ocean of awareness from which it has risen everything that it truly longs for lives there a mind that is accustomed to sinking regularly into the ocean of awareness becomes progressively saturated with its peace and as such a mind rises again it brings this peace with it out into the world into its activities and relationships when I refer to the objects of experience appearing and disappearing in the space of awareness or the mind rising and falling in the ocean of awareness I subtly imply that mind or the objects of experience are one thing and the space or ocean of awareness another that is not intended it is just a manner of speaking all that is or could ever be known is experience all experience takes place in the mind and all there is to mind is consciousness or the knowing of it in other words all that is ever experienced is the activity of consciousness and it is consciousness that is experiencing it imagine or visualize consciousness like a, an ocean of water the waking state is like the waves on the surface of the ocean the dream state is like the currents in the middle of the ocean deep sleep is like the stillness at the depths of the ocean but all there is to the waves the currents and the depths of the ocean is water <coughs> it's all a movement of water all there is to experience is consciousness knowing awareness it's all a movement of knowing the activity of consciousness the water is equally present in all parts of the ocean so awareness or pure knowing is equally present in all experience all there is to a deep depression is the knowing of it all there is to a sublime samadhi is the knowing of it all there is to the taste of tea is the knowing of it nothing other than knowing is ever known and it is knowing that knows this knowing and having nothing in itself other than itself there is nothing in knowing with which it could be divided just as there is nothing in an ocean other than water and as a result the ocean is never divided into parts it is always a single homogeneous indivisible whole and everything that appears in or on the ocean is a temporary modulation of that unlimited and indivisible whole
The water never ceases to be water in order to become a wave. And therefore in the form of the wave, the water doesn't have to return to itself. It never ceases to be itself. Likewise, this knowing or pure consciousness never becomes anything other than itself. It simply modulates itself in all the forms of experience. At, at breakfast this morning, Ken told me that in Peru, the name for a person is animated earth. It's a beautiful understanding. But our name for a person here is condensed consciousness. Just as the dream that we have at night is, as it were, a, a condensation or precipitation within our own minds, of our own minds. So each of our minds is a condensation or a precipitation of consciousness within consciousness, known by consciousness. The mind that seeks happiness or enlightenment, or the heart that longs for God's presence, is like a current in the ocean in search of water. Let your longing come to rest in this understanding. Don't allow the forms of experience to veil or obscure their reality. Experience can be seen to either veil its reality or shine with its reality, depending on the view we take of it. The only difference between most people and people like Ramana Maharshi or Krishna Menon or the Buddha is that most people only see the movie. People like Ramana Maharshi, Atmananda and the Buddha, they watch the movie but they only see the screen. That's the only difference. We all watch the same movie. How we see dictates what we see. The world is not what we see, it is how we see. The world is, the world is not a, a great machine, it is a great thought in the mind of God. Um, when, when I practice uh, self-inquiry, um, I'm getting the experience well, you described, um, but then when I quit, um, immediately I get taken over by thought again. And uh, in daily life I'm as unenlightened as I were before. <laughs> so um, I, I'm, I'm asking myself, and, and you in this case, uh, is it a matter of persistence or endurance? Because I'm doing it for some time now, via meditation. Um, so I, I, I just like to uh, have some affirm, uh, affirmation uh, that I need to continue this way, or am I doing something wrong? Well, to begin with, we feel that we are a separate self, or a finite mind, that practices self-inquiry, and as a result, visits our true nature of pure awareness from time to time, and then goes back to our default mode, which is the separate self. That back and forth takes place for some time, but at a certain point there is a kind of shift in our identity where the 
presence of awareness becomes our default identity. <coughs> Not a place that we visit from time to time, but we move in. It is our home. And we begin to stabilize in that felt understanding. The, the, the old habits may continue for some time, but they're no longer uh, fed by our belief in being a separate self, so in time they, they dwindle. So, but this back and forth that you um, describe it is, is a necessary and inevitable stage to begin with, but just begin to feel more and more that your true nature is not something you visit as a separate, it's not something that you as a separate self visit from time to time. It is what you are. And the separate self is the form that you awareness assume in order to engage with the outside world. And do you have some advice to practice it amidst the chaos of work, for example? That's the perfect time to practice it. <laughs> yeah. But when I'm so heavy uh, attached to, to my mind, because I'm talking with a colleague about something very intellectual or some, well, something No, if, if you're talking with a colleague about something that's important and your full attention is required on the conversation, then give your full attention to the conversation. But when the conversation comes to an end, that is the time to take the opportunity, however brief it may be, to go back to yourself. Because it's not the amount of time, that the, even if you were just to, to, to return to yourself briefly between emails or conversations, that is tremendously powerful. Then if your mind is required to attend to a conversation or a meeting or an email or whatever, you allow your attention to go there and then when it is no longer required, by the world, your attention comes back to, to rest in its source. And uh, last and in, question? Just one thing to add to that. Then in time, this feeling of back and forth will begin to, to diminish and you'll find that when you're engaged, not just in between conversations, but actually in the midst of conversation, the conversation in time will lose its capacity to, av to veil your knowledge of yourself. And right in the midst of the conversation, even an intense or a heated conversation, you still feel that you're centered in yourself. And would you suggest in these brief moments after a conversation, for example, that I ask myself a question, like once uh, who or what is aware of my experience, for example, or <laughs> would you suggest resting as awareness? Well, the only purpose of asking yourself the question is to take you from who you seem to be to who you really are. So the, the, the question itself is, is not, it, it is just, it just, it initiates that journey, if you like, from the separate self back to the true and only self of pure awareness. So. Once you've returned to yourself, then you abide in yourself. That's the essence of self-inquiry. So self-inquiry is precipitated by a question, but the question itself is not really the... People often un misunderstand this about Ramana Maharshi. They think that he recommended people ask themselves, who am I, who am I, who am I, who am I endlessly? No, he recommended you ask yourself that question once. And you allow that question to invite the mind to trace its way back to its source. So just ask the question once. And, in, and then allow the question to, to initiate this tracing back of your mind to its source or essence. But in time, you won't even need to verbalize the question. You just notice and, and ju just the impulse to go back to yourself will rise. You no longer need to verbalize the question. You, you just go back there. It's like um, when I bicycle back to my hotel um, from here. I've been doing it for so many years now. 
I no longer need to get out Google Maps on my iPhone. I always used to get lost going back to my hotel and through the canals, and so I was always stopping on my iPhone. That's like asking the question, you know, finding my. But now I just get on my bike, and without thinking about it, I I get back to the hotel. You don't you don't need I don't need to refer to Google Maps all the time. No. So you don't always need to ask yourself the question, who am I, or what is it that knows or is aware of my experience, or what is the continuous element of my experience. All these questions, they are, they are all sacred questions whose purpose is to attract attention back to its source. But once the, the attention has, is taking that journey, the, the question should be dispensed with. So only use the question if it's if it's if it's necessary and then discard it i have a question um about the um, relaxing of attention and abiding as the self in order to recognize and familiarize myself with that. If I understand it correctly, and I guess that's the question, um, relaxing the attention from objects, but myself is qualityless, so attention can't attach to it. Do I understand correctly that then there is no attention and the mind has no role to play in this? Yes, attention means awareness directed towards an object. So awareness cannot attend to itself. It cannot pay attention to itself because there is nothing objective there to pay attention to. But for the same reason that the eyes cannot see themselves because they are too close to themselves, there is no distance from your eyes to your eyes. So the eyes cannot see themselves. You cannot attend to yourself because you can only attend to something that is at a distance from yourself. So as the attention sinks, as it were, inwards, it, it loses its limitations. So, and, and when you go all the way back to awareness, awareness cannot know itself or does not know itself in subject-object relationship. I think there's a kind of a struggle that my mind is still involved in trying to understand or or to to bring together the 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 relaxing of attention at first seems like an action uh, as opposed to the cessation of an action okay so it's just a relaxing that helps not paying attention to anything objective and there remains a sense of, I guess, still having to do something. I think that's getting in the way. Is that part of the If you ask sense? yourself a question such as, what is it that knows or is aware of my experience? What happens to your mind? It fades. Is that fading an effort of your mind? No, that's that's exactly a cessation of activity. Yes, so this question is a very powerful question because it the mind cannot find the answer to that question well, okay. in any object of experience because you'd immediately ask the question again, but what is it that knows or is aware of this object? I, I, I think I, sudden, I, su I suddenly realized, I don't, I don't know if this makes sense, but... W uh, the cessation leads to something that's always there. Yes, or even more direct than this question, ask yourself the question, am I aware? Same thing. What happens to your mind then? It needs to fade, or at least be somehow bypassed. Yes, in order to answer the question, am I aware? In order to answer yes to the question, am I aware, we have to go directly to the experience of being aware. But we don't have to go there. 
we are the experience of being aware. So being aware becomes aware of being aware, being aware of being aware. So could it be as simple as that all of this mind activity, self-referential thought and stuff is exactly the thing that draws us away? It just has to stop and we're home. That's how it seems. Does that yes. make sense? Yes. Is it seriously? Is it that simple? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, what is it that remains when the activity of the mind ceases? Me. When everything that can be removed from you is removed from you, what remains? The essential you. The essential irreducible you. Don't go looking for that. You cannot find it. It is too close to you. No, I, yeah, I, I see that. I you, see that. you can only be that knowingly. Yeah. yeah. And we are already that, but most of us are that unknowingly, without recognizing it. So, uh, awareness, we, I, awareness, has dreamed this experience within itself, located itself in this body in order to perceive that dream, and in doing so has shrunk itself into the frame, the temporary local frame of a body. And it feels imprisoned. It, it, it longs to go back to its fullness, to its wholeness, to its, to its natural condition. I don't mean to suggest that it's unnatural to manifest the world. I mean to its original condition. But its original condition is not something that is foreign to it. It's not, it's not at a distance from yourself. You are always only infinite consciousness but you have lost yourself in your own dream. So it's not even true to say you have to go back to yourself as if you have left yourself. No, your own dream takes place within yourself. You have veiled yourself with yourself. You, consciousness, have veiled yourself with your own creativity and lost yourself in your own creativity, but you have never ceased being yourself. And the funny thing, it's all one thing at the same time. Yes, you, you, your own creativity is, is, is only yourself, yeah. is only yeah. a play of yourself. So self-inquiry is a kind of unveiling of consciousness. Consciousness veils itself with its own activity. And what we call self-inquiry or meditation or prayer is the unveiling of consciousness and rev and, until it, it, it stands revealed as it essentially is. And, and the, the hint in each of our finite minds of consciousness as it is, is the knowledge I am. That, that is a, the knowledge I am is a trace that God has left in each of our hearts to remind us of his presence. So that is why the thought, I, it's why Ramana Maharshi's version of self-inquiry was the question, who am I? It's why Nisargadatta's formulation of self-inquiry was focus on the I am. And take the thought, I, go to the experience to which you refer when you say, I am. That is a, a, a portal, as it were. It, it is the means by which the mind is gradually divested of its limitations and stands revealed as infinite consciousness. That's why I am is said to be God's name, God's presence in our hearts, the light of consciousness shining in each of our finite minds. That light of consciousness is accessed through the knowledge I am. Well, that's one of the ways. It is also the knowing that pervades the entire mind. So it's not just a, a portal. You could also take the knowing. God's presence is the knowing that pervades all experience. That is infinite consciousness shining not just in the background of our finite experience, but amidst, in the midst of our finite experience. The mind that seeks happiness or enlightenment or the heart that longs for God's presence is like a current in the ocean in search of water. 
let your longing come to rest in this understanding. Don't allow the forms of experience to veil or obscure their reality. Experience can be seen to either veil its reality or shine with its reality, depending on the view we take of it. The only difference between most people and people like Ramana Maharshi or Krishna Menon or the Buddha is that most people only see the movie. People like Ramana Maharshi, Atmananda and the Buddha, they watch the movie but they only see the screen. That's the only difference. We all watch the same movie. How we see dictates what we see. The world is not what we see, it is how we see. The world is, the world is not a, a great machine, it is a great thought in the mind of God. <laughs>